And we're back. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Uh, It's been a while. Hey, let's run the intro. Okay. Start the game already! Ooh, some extra sound effects. Yeah, why not? So, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking another one of those crazy uncle hard root beers. We'll see how it is. It's actually been in my fridge for a little bit. Uh, it's got a mustache on it. It can't be all bad. You never know. Yeah, it could be terrible. It's not too bad. Well, I have Jameson and water, so Irish whiskey, for those of you who don't know what that is. And if you don't know what that is, what are you doing calling yourself a nerd? I feel like I should have a fedora and a samurai sword for this episode. It's been a while. I almost forget how to do this. Yeah, I'm not not sure. What what are we doing? I don't know. I think we're talking about Baldur's Gate 3 or something. Isn't that what we normally do? Oh, we are a Baldur's Gate 3 podcast. Mm. So you're recovering from the plague. I am, yeah. It was was 100% not COVID, but sure felt awful for about three weeks and i'm still not 100 percent better my lungs are still you know spewing up garbage but there's so much shit going around like i've been sick and you know i've been back to like 75 or 80 percent for like a month and a half and i just can't can't get any better than that yeah tanya's been the same way almost everybody i know has been the same way i don't know if we're all suffering from like long COVID symptoms or or what it is, but it just seems this year in particular, everybody's got lingering something. Yeah. Typhoid lung, some kind of lumbago. Yeah. I desperately want to get out and like take a walk every day. And every day I, I walk up, you know, the five steps from my basement to my main floor and think, I can't do it, man. I can't, you know, that's gets my heart racing going up six steps. (laughs) <laughs> combination of old and out of shape and sick. Yeah. Yeah. So what does a sick Telson like? What does he do? Not very much. I, it, it's one of the, the nice things about being able to work from home is that I actually, I mean, I actually put in a, a full day's work most days, mm-hmm. but it took me, you know, between 12 and 16 hours to do a 10 hour day. Cause I'd work for two hours and then I'd have to go have a nap and then I'd work for two hours and I'd have to go have a nap. Um, you yeah. know, there's a uh, video games going on in there. It's, I'm still trying to finish Baldur's Gate three. I think I've I've I'm on a playthrough. I think that I will finish, assuming that I don't fail hard in honor mode. Um, still enjoying it. It's still a good game. I'm still impressed by how much difference there is between uh, different playthroughs. Mm-hmm. But you know, like it's I'm I'm starting to feel like it's time to move on and do something else for a bit. So clarifying question, then you're talking about still doing a playthrough. How many playthroughs did you restart since the last time we spoke about it? Uh, one, I think, because I was last time we spoke, I think I was trying to go because I, I had uh, um, I had made it into Baldur's Gate into Act Three, but I wasn't I, like I wasn't happy about some of the choices I made. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went back and restarted because I had, you know, like an idea for something different. And I'm enjoying this playthrough. Um, so. Hopefully I get to the end. And there's a couple of things that um, that I I'm not happy with, right? Like I made the choice to kill Carlac. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was that? Yeah, that that'd be a tough one. It was, and I, I agonized over it a little bit, and then I thought, okay, well, play it as it comes, right? And you hear from Will, you know, she's bad. We got a hunter down, and then I went over there the way that sort of makes sense, rather than jumping to her before going to the the toll house or whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. And I went to the toll house and I talked to the the paladins and they're like, she's terrible. And I'm like, okay, she's this fiend from hell. I attacked her from afar. Oh, and then later on you find out like, Will's like, I don't know. I don't want to kill her. She's just a tiefling, but too late now. I accidentally killed the owl bear cub. That one hurt. You're a monster. Yeah, I know. No, but I'm playing a Gith Yankee. So yeah, kind of. I've played almost no video games. In fact, I went more than a month without firing up a game. Cut out, man. Why are you coming back? 
Ah, uh, you know what? It was a it was a temporary break. I was busy doing other things, which we'll talk about later. Uh, I was in the middle of a playthrough of the um, Phantom Liberty expansion for Cyberpunk. I'm not very far into it. For those that have played it, I've finished the Black Sapphire party, and now I'm kind of moving on in the main story. Really enjoying it. It's very, I don't know, it, it it's it's almost jarring how different it is from the rest of the game, but in a good way. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be like this spy thriller espionage kind of thing. And again, I'm in the very early, early stages of it. Going to this sort of new area town that was gated off. And uh, it's very different. Almost, you know, imagine like a a small quasi-militant dictatorship, but it's just like one borough inside of a city. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. It's got that vibe, but um, I'm in there sort of acting as like a a secret agent. I get kind of thrown into this world and uh, the types of things that we're doing. Like there's this one sort of interesting sequence where I have to sort of split up from the other people I'm teaming up with to infiltrate this building. And I kind of go in like almost like a James Bond kind of thing where it's like I'm in this wetsuit and I'm swimming in these like flooded tunnels to get in. And then I pull it off and you get into this like sniper perch in the other side and you're basically just kind of camping out watching what's going on across the street from you as you're then helping the other person sort of navigate through guards and stuff like that. Like it's very, Oh, it's like ghost recon. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of got a, like a linear progression path through it. You can either go in quiet or go in loud, but Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. And like, I wasn't doing a heck of a lot besides just, you know, hovering. It was almost like playing like those old school point and click adventure games where you just, you got to make sure that you're hovering the mouse over the right thing for it to to do its thing. It was kind of like that. It wasn't a very long sequence, but it was sort of an interesting break from the rest of cyberpunk. Yeah. Hack, shoot, splatter, shotgun. Yeah. Hack. I know I've trashed on Starfield enough, man, but returning into this and just seeing, even compared to the rest of the cyberpunk game, just how cinematic Mm -hmm. they've made this whole experience in the expansion, it's just unbelievable. Hopefully, I'll get time to uh, finish it off here in the coming weeks or month, but we'll see how that goes. It's it's funny how... uh, Like, how much difference there is between playing games now versus when we were kids. Because I remember, like, it feels like I set aside blocks of, like, 8 and 10 and 12 hours. And I know it was only two or three hours at the time, but it felt like forever. Like, how long was the first Zelda game if you sort of played through it? You could probably finish it in a weekend, right? I never played it, so hmm. so I don't know. But, I mean, I know that it was sort of, like, huge at the time. Maybe, maybe it's over two weekends, right? And now, uh, like, things like Baldur's Gate, where I have hundreds of hours into the game. And you can speed run it in like 32 hours or whatever. But even that, like that's, that's a lot of gameplay. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's hundreds of hours of voice recordings for you to listen to. But it's a, you know, it's a completely different medium from what it was. Like it's the, I know we've talked about how movies and, and TV, like the, the formula has shifted and changed over the years too, but The, the difference is night and day. Like you think back 10 years ago, the amount of reading that you had to do and then go back 25 or 30 years ago and think about the amount of reading that you had to do out of the manual that came with the game. Oh my God. Yeah. Like Falcon 5.0 that came with a manual for an actual fighter aircraft. It was insane. Speaking of, um, this, it was so tying back into like, what do I do when I'm sick? At the same time that I was sick or just slightly after, um, Cindy's aunt passed away. So she had to go and, you know, spend a week dealing with that. So I was on my own and not feeling well. So I watched all of the Mission Impossible movies. And speaking of the change in movies, like you watch the first movie and it's like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Right. Now it feels like it's from the 50s. Like it feels like it should be black and white. Just like all, all of the action beats are different. All of the story beats are different. There's, there's lots of like simple exposition in the middle. There's stuff where you have to figure out what happened. No one tells you. You got to figure it out. And I got to say, it's actually slightly less enjoyable than watching modern movies. Right? It's just, it's less punchy. 
Yeah, and I, I imagine some of that is just we're kind of acclimatized to it now. A bit. You know, our attention is trained to function a certain way, and things that don't function that way tend to hold it a little bit less now. Like, I like those old movies still, but I agree that they almost, it's the rose-colored glasses nostalgia thing, right? Like, they seem better. I remember them being better than what they feel like re-watching them now. And it's never a case of where it's like, oh, I really, really love this movie. And I go back and watch it. And it's like, oh, this is painful slog. But you definitely have that. You remember the good parts. Yeah. Yeah. But even the experience, right? Like, I don't know. Um, you don't have to go that far back. Do you remember watching, what are we talking now, 25 years, I guess, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies when they came out? That's 25 years ago? That can't be. Fellowship was 99, wasn't it? Came out the same year as the first Matrix movie, didn't it? Oh my god, I gotta look it up, because that's a long time. It is a long time. It doesn't feel like it should be that long ago. It was... Da, 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 why do they not have... Uh, 2001. So, 23 years ago now. Wow. The first Mission Impossible movie came out in 1996, and it feels old. The Lord of the Rings movies feel not that old. No, but have you rewatched them like in the last few years? Uh yeah, we rewatched them a couple of years ago. And and they're not they're not perfect, but they're still really good. Pacing is what gets me though. And of course, I've got made the mistake of I own like the director's cut versions too, mm -hmm. which are just like 30% longer. And yeah. and they still are missing things from the book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just so, so different, you know, like I, I, I don't mind going back to slower times. Like I think about old Star Trek fondly. Yeah. You know, but it's short, bite sized, episodic, simple. There's there's I think approaching it from the other way, because you mentioned that we're sort of programmed to, to like what it is. I think coming at it from the other direction, I think probably what they've done is gone. What works? Let's do that harder. Mm hmm. Right. So they've tightened up the formula that will get into our brains. And there's, you know, there's pluses and minuses with that. On the one hand, we get movies that we really enjoy. On the other hand, we're probably never going to find anything really different. This is just not profitable. How are you seeing old technology in movies? Does it pull you out? Uh, it depends. Um, there's some that do it really well where it's, it's sort of generic, like it's on a computer. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's fine, right? Cause it's, it's, it, you can slot that in anywhere when they start doing, Oh, is it the new three X DX two X nine five two, you know, mm -hmm. extra, extra speed. I'm like, a, that's not a thing. It has never been a thing. And B stop. I did know. Here's one thing that I noted that I pulled out of all of the mission impossible movies is that Hollywood and media in general has moved away from this sort of idea of being hyper specific about hardware, mm -hmm. right? In the first Impossible Mission movie, they talk about like what kind of gun is it? They talk about like it's it's this with this attachment with with that thing from so and so, right? It's the super hyper specific, the Tom Clancy description of like, you know, this is this kind of tank. To now, it's like. It's it's a computer driven AI thing or, you know, it's a it's a machine gun or it's a sniper rifle. Right. It's shown as technically accurate, but they don't describe it as, you know, all of its technical name, which I think is a positive move. Because when someone says, oh, I know this, this is Unix. <laughs> right. That pulls me out a little bit. Yeah. I find it funny because like. And this goes back to the Lord of the Rings, like, oh, my God, that was 23 years ago. Tanya and I recently rewatched the the Bourne series. And you go yep. back to when that first movie was made. And, like, you see those scenes where it's like, you know, those rooms that are filled with computers and displays on the walls. And everybody's, they're using monitors that look like the kind of shit we used to, like, cart around to land parties. Like, yep. big 100-pound CRTs and stuff. It's like, wow. It's a, it's a weird phenomenon. Like, I look back on those days fondly, but there's this thing that I don't know how to describe it, but your perception of things changes without the environment changing. I call it the, the, the small TV syndrome, and I have it right now. Think about the TVs that we had when we grew up. 
you know, if you were really lucky and wealthy, you had like a 24 inch that was in a console, the size of half your living room, but it was a 24 mm-hmm. inch screen square corner to corner. Yeah. And it was 36 inches deep. <laughs> yeah. Early flat screens, like not monitors, but TVs that we got were like 32 inch, like 720i interlaced shit. Oh man. 720 was amazing. Now we've had it for, I don't know, six, eight years, I guess. But like our big TV in the living room, when we got it, was a 55 inch, like 4K UHD. And it's huge. Absolutely huge. And now every time I look at it, I can almost see it getting smaller. Yeah. Yep. I, I have exactly the same situation. When we uh, when we sold our house, I had, because I have, I have never previously had a big TV, like the biggest one. We still have, our old one is still a 42. Uh, do you remember uh, when we lived in the apartment on uh, Bridge Street? So we bought it when we lived there. So this this TV is now 12 or 13 years old, right? It's, it's, uh, it's 1080p and it's 42 inches. And when we got it, I thought it was huge. And now the monitor that I have on my desk right now is almost that big. Yeah. Right? It's... It's crazy how much bigger they've got. I remember when we were working at Stream, I thought to myself, I wonder how ridiculous monitors get, like TVs, monitors, LCDs, flat screens. And I looked up a 60-inch LCD, and it was $15,000. You know, And now a 16-inch LCD, you can buy at Walmart for 200 bucks. Now, it's probably not as good, but... It might be better. Who knows? The technology evolution I can at least understand, though, right? Yes. But the perception changing is weird because it's not like it's not like I'm going into other people's houses and seeing their bigger TVs and I'm jealous. It's not like I got a bigger one in the office at work. You know, oh, I'm I'm accustomed to this bigger one and I'm going home and mine seems small. Like realistically speaking, this is probably the largest television, maybe with the exception of Tanya's parents. That I've ever sat in front of, and theirs can't be much bigger. It might be a 60. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sitting far away from it. It's not like we've rearranged the furniture, like we're the same distance we always are. And every time I watch something on it, it gets smaller. It's, yeah, it's bizarre. I have exactly the same thing with our TV. It's, and I think, I think it's just the the human, it's the coping mechanism. Because when you first get it, it's new and you're paying attention to all the details about it. And then as time goes on, you get used to it, and it just becomes that's a normal size TV. Because I mean, my first, my first, t- I got a TV in my bedroom when I was seven, I guess, like ten inch black and white. I'm not even sure it was ten inch. It might have been eight or nine, but it was tiny. You could literally see the uh, the little squares, the little phosphor lines between mm-hmm. the. I mean, you, you like what's on there? I don't know. It could be pong. It could be tennis. It could be golf. I don't know. Right, because it was tiny, but I thought like this is this is the cat's ass. It's amazing. I got one in my own bedroom. I do. I can put it on a stack of comic books and or, or comic books and uh, watch it while I'm lying in bed. Like this is awesome. Comes in two colors: white and slightly less white. <laughs> I can play with the the. <laughs> and I had, of course, I was in Northern Saskatchewan at the time. I had one channel: CBC out of Lloyd Minster. Came on at 7.30 a.m. and went off air at 11.30 p.m. I miss those days when we weren't saturated with media 24-7. Yeah, but you miss them the way you miss the first Mission Impossible movie. If you were to go back now and have to relive those days, you'd be like, this fucking sucks. I don't know if I would. I think I would probably, because there's a lot of hobbies that fell by the wayside because I'm busy trying to keep up. Mm -hmm. Um. Right. Like I wouldn't be I wouldn't be playing Baldur's Gate, you know, for six hours a day. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I wouldn't be worried about like I'm only two seasons into elementary and I've been without Netflix for a year. Like, what am I missing? Right. It would be I miss Dallas this week. Oh, well, whatever. I'm going to go fishing. But you felt that way about it then because you didn't experience the alternative, like to go from now back to then, like just the, the lack of connectivity, I think. I mean, it might be better for the, you know, the human race, but I think there would be something that you would feel was I, absent. I think you would, but I think you would quickly get used to it again. 
I, I think I think that you would you it would always be it would be like I like I imagine quitting smoking is right where as time goes on it becomes less and less of an issue but you never stop thinking about the fact that you know I used to smoke and now I don't maybe I, I don't know the only thing that I could compare it to is going on vacation mm-hmm. like I can't do more than about five days like you know go disconnect get away. Like I'm going stir crazy after five days. I'm ready to get home. My brain is just going nuts, just having nothing to really do. Think about like, I can only read so many books. I can only, you know, relax for so long. I wasn't like that even when I was younger. You know, it'd be like, oh, it's summer. I mean, I got to work, but like, otherwise I can just shut my brain off. I can't now. I'm not programmed that way. I I can. I mean, I can't roll back to that version of the operating system. I, I, I'm, I'm getting to the point and it might just be because I've gone like over one more tipping point of aging. Um, but like the last time that we went camping, I mean, I do get bored, but I actually go through that almost right away where Mm -hmm. I have two days of, Oh my God. Like I'm thinking about the video games that I'm playing. I'm thinking about the conversations I had on discord. I'm thinking about, you know, what shows I'm, I'm trying to keep up on. I'm thinking about, uh, like what, I don't know, whatever digital bullshit twitter and reddit and all that stuff is is going through and then i find myself sitting on a log staring at at water lapping up on a shore and i think this is okay i'm happy with this right my brain doesn't shut off it just starts going down different channels and i start thinking sort of bigger longer slower thoughts now yeah i get that i get that it's funny i had a dream actually about a week ago about you and I did one of us turn into a bear. Cause that would be weird. No, <laughs> no, we were doing like a midlife crisis. We decided to like get motorcycles and go on like a road trip where we were just driving to, to places in the middle of nowhere and camping. Now to set it up, uh, I think I've plugged this channel before uh, Milo Rossi, mini minute man. He does a lot of archeology span stuff, but he's been doing like a, a road trip vlog kind of thing where he's going, you know, he's driving halfway across the United States, seeing different sites, ghost towns, you know, natural monuments, things like that. And then on the vlog channel, he's just sort of documenting each day of the trip where he's like driving, setting up camp somewhere, you know, figuring out how to eat. Like, it's kind of like going camping, like he's roughing it in so much as, you know, he's got a motorcycle there and he's still got a cell phone and a camera and stuff. But you know, this doesn't have cell reception where he is. But anyway, the dream was that you and I decided, you know what? We're going to get motorcycles. We'll probably sell them afterwards. We're going to drive across Canada, like over a period of six weeks. No agenda. We're just going to go somewhere, set up camp, do some shit, play some D&D, record a couple of podcast episodes in the middle of the woods, pack up, go somewhere else, kind of do it all over again. I mean, it sounds interesting. If if one of us win the lottery, I think we should do it. Mm. You know, or if a Patreon ever really takes off. <laughs> I think you have to start one for that to happen. It just doesn't, uh, doesn't immediately get there. I assumed that they just spontaneously, like, spawned. Yeah. I didn't realize that I had to lay an egg. <laughs> but it sounds interesting. Have you ever read a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? No. Um, so we, t- we talked for, uh, context, we had a, a pre pre podcast meeting. Um, and one of the things that we talked about, and I think it's an important thing to talk about is what the heck are we doing? Um, and sort of the conclusion was we should have a little bit less of the, uh, homework assignments. So I don't want to do that, but I do think that it would be neat to sort of recommend stuff to each other. Mm-hmm. Right. And Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is one that I would highly recommend. I read it when I was in my teens. Like, it's an old book. Mm-hmm. It's I think it was written in the 70s or the 80s. And it's it's basically that. It's a story of a guy who's, who's you know, he starts off like this and goes like, this life is terrible. I'm just going to hop on my motorcycle and go and do stuff. And then he wrote a book about it or something. I don't know. Like, I read it when I was a teenager, which, as we've established, is 100 years ago. So... Might be entirely wrong, but I do remember really enjoying the, pardon me, the book. I'll have to check it out one of these decades. Yeah, I mean, add it to the bottom of the 150 books that you're going to read. Mm-hmm. I do need to read more. 
I have a friend who uh, she she makes a list of, and she might actually listen to this. Uh, so if you are, hi Jen. Um, she basically counts the books that she reads in a year, and I mean some of them are, you know, like uh, the you know the writings of Frederick Nietzsche, and some of them are like the Hungry Caterpillar. But they all count, mm-hmm. right? And I forget what the number came to, but it was well north of a hundred uh, the the year that I know about. So it's an interesting thing to do to sort of like just write down these, the books I read this year. I don't know. Anyway, what were we talking about? What weren't we talking about? I think we started at video games, ended up on a motorcycle trip. Yeah. Zen and Grease Monkey. And, and now we're talking about reading books. I do want to get back to video games, though. Okay. Because something important is happening in the next week or so. <gasps> Horizon Forbidden West. Uh, is releasing on PC March 21st. That's almost a month away. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not allowed to to I I don't I don't know if I'm getting it for my birthday at all. I have no clue. I hope I've already <laughs> actually downloaded it or whatever. <laughs> but I'm not allowed to play it until my birthday cuz it's a birthday gift. So Well, there you go. Yeah. Can't it be an early birthday gift? I don't know. I'm yeah. Here's the thing: is it's entirely on the honor system. I'm sure that nobody is actually checking up on me. So neither one of us have played uh, or have a PlayStation. Nope. So we haven't played the sequel. We both played Horizon Zero Dawn after it came out on PC. Well after for me, I didn't even know it existed until I think I was looking for. I, I remember reaching out to you and say, "I need a video game where you shoot robot dinosaurs." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you something like that. And you recommended this to me. And I'm glad you did because I loved it. Have you managed to avoid spoilers for the second game so far? I have not heard anything about the game other than the official trailers that have played in the uh, uh, the store page on Steam. And I didn't mm-hmm. even watch more. I think I watched half of one of those and only because it was on autoplay. So, yeah, I have completely avoided spoilers as far as I know. You've played the first game more recently than I have, so this is probably a question more for you because it's fresher. What are your hopes for the second game? Oh man, I you know what? I just I want to I want to. This is a weird thing about human nature. I actually want the same game again, with maybe some slight tweaks and, and minor changes. I don't. There was nothing really about the first game that I would change. Mm-hmm. I was I was completely happy with it. Uh, Graphics were good. Control was good. Play was good. It would be nice to have, I don't know, like the continuation of the story, because I think whatever whatever they were doing in the first one was was totally fine by me. I would, you know, just give me give me more of the same. Maybe a, a slightly bigger variety in the robot animals. Mm-hmm. But there's a, a really good sort of in-game lore reason for why there's there is what there is. That's about it. I think my want is almost what I don't want them to do. I don't want them to lessen the experience of the first game. You know, some some games or movies they have that tendency. I mean, we got to outdo the first game. We got to, you know, yeah. somehow be retcon, bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah, or retcon the, you know, what happened to actually lessen the impact of the events of the first game or whatever. I think I enjoyed that game for different reasons than you did like the core gameplay loop the combat mechanics yeah they were fun like you know but that wasn't like i think you're diving into games more mechanically than i am now (laughs) probably like i honestly think i like when i dive into the second game i might play it on like an easy difficulty setting just so that i can kind of cruise through it enjoy it from for the atmosphere enjoy it for the story maybe i'll go back and play it on a like a more difficult setting later but mm-hmm. that's not what got me about the first game. Well, th- honestly, the first game for me, it was all about like the story. Mm-hmm. Um, I did not enjoy the expansion as much as the base game. Um, it, like it wasn't, it wasn't worse. It wasn't f- like bad in any way. It just, it felt a little bit like it didn't fit story wise, right? It was. It was very much like, here's the main story, and it's nice and tightly contained. And then, whoop, you know, we had this little little bulb on the side that was the expansion content. And it was fun, and it was new, 
So did you play the expansion content after finishing the main game story? The first time, yes. Okay. I think that's where maybe it was different for me. I just kind of moved into that and started playing it in the middle of my main game story. So it didn't feel out of place to me. Like it felt like, oh, I'm 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 kind of like I, I thought I had some important shit I needed to do over there and maybe I should be going back and doing that, but I'm I'm enjoying this shit over here now. But it didn't feel you know, I didn't I didn't have the 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 climax and ending and mystery solved from the first game yet. Ah, uh, I didn't okay, so I didn't quite get there. I got to the cause there's a certain point where it recommends that you and I I can't remember if it how exactly this works out, but there's some point in the game where it basically says you should do the, you know, you should do the expansion before you do this. Mm-hmm. Don't have to, but you should. And I did do it at that point. And it, like that, I, I'm, I'm making a much bigger deal of the, um, the out of placeness of it than mm-hmm. I actually felt. It was just like, okay, this feels like it's in the same world. It just, the vibe is slightly different, right? Which makes sense. It's like geographically different. Um, but there's a, a few more kind of like fetch questy type things. Uh, the mini games are a, are a, a departure mm-hmm. uh, from the main game. Uh, they're good. It's just it's just different. It's also when you're playing on the the harder difficulties, it it it's harder to do things out of order, mm-hmm. right? Because the level of that area is quite a bit higher. But I mean, overall, like I I don't I have no complaints about any of it. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed it from beginning to end. I thought the story was was well written. It was topical and timely. I recognized myself in several of the uh, um, the evil people from the past, right? Sort of the the elements of our everyday society. I'm like, okay, morality's coming into my video games, and I I identify it. I'm not not I'm not sure that I like the finger you're shaking at me, but it's well placed. So. But it was a great story, I thought. It really was. I I mean, it was telegraphed a little bit. That's not a complaint because it kept you interesting. Kept it um kept you guessing and speculating as to how it was gonna gonna play out. Like mm-hmm. if you don't telegraph something enough and it's just like all mystery until the big reveal, you lose interest if you're not engaged in trying to f- figure it out for yourself. And I think it did a good job of balancing out that. Yeah. You know, the the premise, the idea of it, I really liked. You know, again, it's not super original, but well executed. Yes. And I just hope that the second game doesn't... And I know it's silly to say, because, like, I've played the first game, I've enjoyed it, it's over. Playing the second game isn't going to take away the enjoyment that I had when I played through the first game, but... When you try and make the second one bigger and faster and stronger... Sometimes it makes the first one a bit of a, a a wet firework. It doesn't even have to make it bigger, faster, stronger, right? Like sometimes it's just, oh, well, we need to tell a new story with gravity. And the only way we can do that is by cheapening the story we already told. Actually, that thing that you thought was a big deal turns out it wasn't all that big of a deal because what we got now is the big deal. Or It's actually, a bigger Death Star. Things things didn't actually unfold the way we made you think they unfolded. It it's happening a different way. You know, we're retelling the same story from a different perspective. Sometimes works. Taking sometimes. taking everything that you learned about that story and telling you actually, you know what, you were just wrong. Well, actually, <laughs> sort of retroactively can ruin that experience, and I don't like it when games do that. And it's one of those stories that like. It had a trajectory. It got to where it needed to go. And while I can think of a few directions that could go from there, most of the directions that I'm thinking of would be like, oh, this would be actually a good expansion to the first game, not Mm -hmm. let's develop a whole new game with its own sort of climax, jumping off from where we left Mm. off. So I don't know. Jumping off is hard to with the same character. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, I really, I really enjoy the character of of Aloy. I also really enjoy the fact that they didn't try and shoehorn a romance into that story because mm-hmm. it really wouldn't have fit. No. Um, oh, one thing I would like to see. Uh, do you remember the guy that you run into outside of a couple of the scavenger camps 
Um, he's got the two little dots under his eye. Um, he's oh the the guy that just ends up being a straight up killer. Yeah, that's like oh you're like me. You know, it's been a yeah. long time since I've played it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the guy I'm talking about. I mean, he's a trope that shows up all over the place. But he's like, I'm the outsider, and I don't know how to do anything except kill. So here I am killing people. And yeah. he's Dexter, basically. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to have him show up in the second game, but I don't think that's possible. Didn't we end up killing him in the first game at the I end? Think, I think so. I, I can't think remember there, for sure. I know there was a thing where he would get, where it was like he challenged you to a fight. He's like, one of us has to do the thing or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember how that played out. It was it was a neat little sort of side excursion. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a, it was a neat... I, I like parallel threads in stories where it's like, you know, this doesn't really advance the main plot, but it's a thing that is of interest that's moving along. That is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, right? It's the the other guys outside of the story. It's, mm-hmm. it's interesting. Um, it's difficult too because you end up at the end of the first game with a great deal of power, and it's it's hard to go back to like, well, you're level one again. You know, here's your bent stick, and you got to go kill rats until you get a bigger bent stick. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, and I guess my worry, my hesitation is probably the same hesitation I have. And I haven't watched the second Avatar movie yet. Have you? No. Not really interested. No. And it's it's very much. I mean, I wasn't. It was visually cool at mm-hmm. the time, but like it was yep. it, it wasn't a great movie. No, it was fine. It was fine. You know, it was Burn Gully and Pocahontas, and then you mash them together and put it in 3D. You're good to go, right? Oversimplification. But, like, there's, you know, example of a movie that I can't help but feel. It's like, oh, we had this sort of existential crisis thing happening over in this part of the world. And now we're just going to go a few miles that way into a whole new part of the world with all new, like, people. And, oh, there's there's, there's these big blue people over here, but they, they swim now. And where were you guys when, you know, shit was going down over here? Like we were having sex with the dolphins, man. Oh, sorry. It's not sex. We're just melding our minds with, mm-hmm. with our pseudopods. Now, fortunately, the, the way Horizon Zero Dawn ended, it wasn't one of those like ooh existential crisis. It isn't like watching a, a Marvel movie where about halfway into it, you're like, you know, the rest of the Avengers should just kind of show up and deal with this. This is a big enough problem that like, where the, where the fuck's Captain America? Like where's Thor? Have you, have you watched the Marvels yet? Uh, I've seen enough clips of it. I have not watched the movie. Um, I would recommend watching it. Um, not so much because it's great. It's not, um, it's not bad, right? Like Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's decent, it's a, it's, fine. it's a Marvel movie. It's fine. It's a it's a Marvel movie. It's fine. Um, but the because we started watching Ms. Marvel, the TV series, mm-hmm. um, and it's a story about a, a young lady in high school. So I was like, I'm not really interested yeah, in this. The story is not for me. I can tell that it's being done okay. Like I haven't watched it, but I know enough about it. Like it's yeah, I'm and doing that was a decent exactly job it. of it, but just not for me. I watched it. I watched, we watched the first like three or four episodes and I was like, you know what? This is okay, but I'm just not interested. Mm -hmm. Um, But in the movie, um, that actress absolutely steals the movie. And it's a good thing she does because listen, I know a lot of people have problems with Brie Larson. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put it all on her. I'm sure a lot of it is the writing for that character and the decisions they made for it. Usually you're supposed to like the protagonist in a movie Mm -hmm. or they have to be an interesting, like anti-hero, right? She's Mm -hmm. neither of those. I liked her in the first one. I liked her a lot in the first one. I didn't. It might've been my rose colors, 80, 80s glasses though. Cause that was one of the things I really liked about those, that, uh, that movie was that they really nailed the vibe of the eighties really well. Right. I, I didn't mind the movie. I didn't like her. Ah. Okay. You know, like Nick Cage, like Samuel L. Jackson stole that movie. Mm-hmm. Nick Fury. 
<laughs> Sorry. You, you said Nick Cage. <laughs> Can you imagine Nicolas Cage playing Nick Fury? Oh, that would be brilliant. Uh, I, <laughs> like, sorry, mix off, up like Luke Cage and and. Uh, yep. Anyway. No, I, I I understand completely. I'm just now yes, I'm in the me- I'm, I'm in the headspace of Nicolas Cage as Nick Fury, and I'm thinking like not just Nicolas Cage, but Nicolas Cage when he's off the rails crazy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a Shield movie I'd watch. <laughs> And actually might, you know, serve like the original character fairly well, too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because Samuel L. Jackson did very much make that his own. And it's different from the comics. And that's fine. (sighs) Sorry. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Not the bees! (laughs) Oh, man, I can just see that. It would be great. That, oh, a S.H.I.E.L.D. movie where Nicolas Cage literally plays all of the characters. <laughs> uh, sorry. Continue. Uh, Do you want to get into some table talk? Sure. I've been busy for the last month and a bit. Before we get into it. Do you want to talk about your game, what you have going on? Have you been playing with your other group? No, we haven't haven't done anything. Um, I, there's our Sunday group is pretty much the only one I'm taking part in if it ever if we ever play again, which I hope will happen soon. I have done some work on that. Um, I have discovered that the map that I made is a much much larger than I thought. So there will be some interesting repercussions when we get together again. Otherwise, everything I could tell you would be spoilers. So, can't do that. What have you got going on? Well, I have started working on, almost by accident, my own fantasy setting. And I'm going to make the differentiation between campaign setting and fantasy setting. Because, like an idiot, I've decided to approach this as a bigger thing than it probably should have been. It kind of spun out of control. I didn't mean to do it. I should back up and say, you know, a fantasy setting has probably been on both of our radars forever. Mm-hmm. Not a D&D game setting, but we've talked about the times that we've started writing a book multiple times, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's always been a goal. Yeah, it's a dream. But it wasn't my goal this year. And somehow I find myself inching closer to it. Uh, The particular push started out with me uh, trying to plan a small setting for um, some mini campaign games that I'm going to be running, uh, doing some paid games. And I got a bit of a roll going and have zero restraint when it comes to like getting on a creative tangent. I started rolling at the top of the hill and I just... Now that I've put time into it, I've been working on this in my spare time for more than a month now. It's very much become like a tail wagging the dog situation, you know, where I was originally going to do this mini campaign stuff. I want to just get a small sort of setting going. And now it's, well, I'm creating this big thing and I can't wait to start doing games so that I can start using them to help flesh out the big thing. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I haven't been playing video games for more than a month. I've been spending my weekends and stuff putting way too much time into this. The working title for this project uh, right now is called Age of Arrival, which will make a little bit more sense when we talk about the premise and the seed idea. I don't want to get too bogged down in the specific details because like, we'll be here forever. But I, I'll, I'll talk about some things at a high level, but I really want to talk about the process because process was something that sort of came yeah. to light when we were trying to work together on something. And I... If you were to try and jump in and work with me right now, like you'd probably slit your own throat. (laughs) I'm taking the long route, the winding sort of get lost in the woods, circle back, double back on yourself 10 times before getting to the end point route for literally everything I'm doing here. And I'm absolutely (laughs) loving it. Well, I mean, that's the important bit. But I did want to talk about you. You flagged it looking at the show notes that you wanted to talk about things like seed ideas, inspiration, fence posts for taking on something like this. That's kind of where I want to focus. But please, 
interrupt, ask me all sorts of questions. Well, I mean, I I did again. We we talked about this very briefly previously, um, and you asked me to write down some questions, so I did. Ooh. And you've answered the first one, which is why. Um, not so much like why would someone do this, but why do you want to do it, and what what drives you, right? So you've answered that one. <laughs> um, yeah, because I couldn't help myself is yeah. basically the answer. Uh, so I the, like the second question is like, who is your audience for this? Like, who are you making it for? Me right now. Okay, but a lot of times, like when I'm when I'm doing something creative like this, I think. Even if it's just in the back of my head, like if I had to present this to, you know, X, Y, and Z, here are the people who would enjoy this, I think. Like, do you have someone in the back of your mind when you're creating stuff? I do, sort of. I don't have necessarily a someone. I have a a buffet of potential someones. Okay. I guess that kind of gets into fence posts about, like, once I decided I was turning this into a thing... What sort of guiding principles did I put in place to to sort of stick to, right? Like, mm -hmm. these are the questions I need to answer before I can start even asking and answering the real questions. So once I decided I was building something, what I decided very quickly was to build something that was, in air quotes, legally distinct. Now, I don't mm -hmm. know what that term means. I'm not a lawyer. But I wanted to very intentionally, with almost everything that I was doing, steer around existing IP. Mm -hmm. Because as this got bigger, I, I saw potential for like, hey, I could turn this into something like a product. But I couldn't do that if I was just riffing off of other material. My homebrew campaign that I run right now is in a homebrew game setting that is literally built on top of the ruins of existing IP. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a future sort of post post apocalypse and then you know far enough ahead that you lose that post apocalyptic tome sword coast Faerun, like the map is starts off as a map of that place and a main city was built on top of the ruins of water deep and as much as i do with that setting it's always gonna be water deep i could never sell that I could never show a map of of Faerun and stick a different name on it and say no 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 this isn't Faerun. i mean it it used to be Faerun. I couldn't do that. So I wanted to not paint myself into any corners with this. Just in case, potentially decide, you know, I want to sell out, start monetizing it. That's not my primary objective. But I just don't want to close any doors. Mm -hmm. Fence post number two, I'm not approaching it as a tabletop campaign setting explicitly. Which changes things significantly, but I am doing it with the intention of like 5e adaptation being the obvious next step. Maybe I'll take another stab at writing a fantasy novel or six down the road or, you know, <laughs> fuck it. Maybe you'll do it for me and I'll have this framework to, to, to give you to start. When you're doing like a, a campaign setting for, for tabletop games, and we've talked about this before. Yeah, you got to figure out some of the stuff out here, but your focus tends to be sort of the local stuff, right? Like what's happening around your players, what's important to the now. Mm -hmm. But when you're approaching a fantasy setting as a framework to tell stories in, the focus has to be much more big picture. I'm not naming every stream and putting every little town on the map. I'm sort of creating an interesting world and creating a world state, which has, you know, your centers of power. Mm -hmm your environment for story to happen in. You've got what makes this world unique, all of its flavor. I'm kind of focused on building that. Eventually, I'll get to the smaller stories when I decide I want to run games in this world. But my objective is really to be able to like have this map, be able to point to a place at random on it, to have enough detail that you could plausibly improvise a story that mm -hmm. still fits into the, the bigger world. I guess the best way to, to explain it, and I think I mentioned this to you when we were talking last, I'm making Middle Earth, not the Lord of the Rings or the Hobbit. Yeah. You know, and I don't, I don't know with Tolkien's approach, like he probably started small and I know like he's got the, the Silmarillion and all of that stuff that's kind of like expanded material about it. I know some authors will kind of have a, here's all the shit that I figured out about the world before I start writing chapter one. I have an idea for the type of characters and story that I want to tell in this world. I want to make a world appropriate for that to, to happen in. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. 
the Hobbit, the Lord of the Rings, that can all come later. And that's kind of the point of doing this to make it easier to do that stuff later. I have to do a little bit of a well, actually, because I, I did look into Tolkien a little bit when I was trying to actually when I was trying to write previously. And he actually started with the languages because that was his. Yes. 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 That was that was his thing. Um, all right. So that leads me really uh, well into my next question, which you kind of answered, but a, a little mm -hmm. bit of extra would be good. Uh, is what is, what does your audience get out of it? Um, and there's a little bit of an addendum to that as well, which is like, how do you deliver that? Like, how how do you get what's in your head onto paper? How does that how is that useful to someone else who would take this setting and go, okay, well, I want to tell a story here. Admittedly, I still need to figure that part out. It's a big question. It is a big question. I'm envisioning it almost being like a core module and addendum type of thing. Now, what the, the, the delivery mechanism for that is, whether it's like a D and D campaign book, right? Like you can mm -hmm. buy, um, Matt Mercer's, uh, campaign guide for wild mount. And that delivers a lot of that stuff there, but it is very much for D and D fifth edition. Mm -hmm. I'm envisioning this kind of being split up so that here's the core fantasy setting and then here's all of this companion stuff that i can use to adapt it to fifth edition adapt it to whatever like if, if if ultimately the first sort of product ends up being a campaign setting i'm okay with that my approach to building this i'm just trying to think a little bit bigger picture now before i, I try and make it sound like i'm doing way too much here i do need to sort of back up and say that like Legally distinct doesn't mean reinventing the wheel just for the sake of having like a worse wheel with a weird name. <laughs> hey, this one's square. It's better because it's got pointy bits. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not suggesting here that I'm, I'm having anything overly original result from this. I'm just putting my own spin on some things. So I'm going to build off the stuff that is either public domain or not subject to copyright stuff that is expected content for fantasy settings and then flavor it. So there's going to be elves, there's going to be dwarves, orcs, goblins. Like I'm not just going to come up. Oh, there's this totally not elf race with pointy ears and, and flowery language. And you know, they're called nelfs. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> they're called falcons because they live in space. <laughs> I'm going to have all of that. There's, you know, my audience at its base level is going to be an audience that wants a fantasy setting. I'm not creating something that is, is like a new genre. I'm not that talented. I have no delusions about the reality that anybody will participate in this, but me, mm -hmm. but I'm not closing those doors where I'm unsure to go back to your question is whether I would want to look at it as a typical old school publishing model of, okay, I create this setting and here's a book or whether I might want to experiment with delivering that content in a different way. I have my own talents. I'm a web developer. I do a lot of things online. There's different sort of models for monetizing this content that doesn't involve, let me give most of my money to a publisher. Mm-hmm. There's ways that don't involve, let me limit my margins by creating a physical product. I will say that it is not my intention to just slap shit in a PDF and sell it. Like if I'm going to go a digital route, I think I'm going to try and do something a little bit different. Something that um, maybe builds off of like the Patreon model where like you can buy the core content or you can get into it and... I'll continuously be adding things like story modules to it, stuff that you can use if you're not wanting to homebrew a game in this setting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I start doing some novellas and stuff like, I, you know, I, I'm seeing this more as like a, a framework for a few different creative outlets. And my audience will just be the kind of people that are into that shit. Me <laughs> using it how they want to use it. Right. I yeah. do think, obviously, you know, I play a lot of D&D. &D. 
I'm going to be introducing this content in a D&D type situation. I've already been throwing around the idea. I know we did a Side Hustles episode of maybe not running my own game as an online, like sort of live stream based game, but being a producer for a game for more charismatic folk Mm -hmm. that want to, you know, pay me to do it, but handle a lot of the writing and, 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 leg work and use the setting for that. Like I'm, I'm thinking about ways I can kind of cross pollinate and double dip and triple dip when I'm doing this, whether it's me running my own games or me doing other stuff that leans on this content. So it's not a satisfying answer to the who's it for and what are they going to use it for? I haven't narrowed that focus yet. Right now I'm still very much world building. Well, it's at the very beginning. It was more a, a philosophy question, really, than it was a, a, you know, hey, like tell me what your your timeline deliverable is, and uh, yeah. we'll make you stick to that schedule. And I think if I were, you know, approaching it like product first, I could have better answers for that. Right now, I'm 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 approaching it as a as a creative process, and maybe a product will reveal itself more clearly in time. I'm doing it with the potential for a product in mind. I just don't know what that product is yet. So uh, on the, the timeline question, how much time do you think will end up being invested before you think to yourself, yeah, this is, this is pretty much finished, or at least at a stage where it's, it's shareable? I'll probably need to make decisions about how I'm delivering it before I can really provide an answer one way or the other. Like if I go back to that sort of Patreon model. Mm-hmm almost like early access video gamey kind of model. It's like things that end up on Kickstarter. I hate, like, I'm not a big fan of that type of thing, but like Kickstarter stuff that is just ideas, Mm -hmm. they never go anywhere. And anybody that gets involved, like even if they get funded, it never pays out because you never meet your, whatever your requirement is to get the payout. But then there's the stuff that ends up on there. That's like, this isn't finished yet, but we have enough material to show you that a, we're serious about it. Mm-hmm. And B that, you know, there's, 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 there's a product in there, maybe not refined yet. Like you're getting value for your money now and that will refine itself later. Like if mm-hmm. I can get to that point, I think that's when I'll start exploring how that works. Like, you know, and maybe it's something I just, I, maybe I don't even charge for the, the, the base setting. Maybe that's sort of the, Hey, here's this cool thing. And I'm going to try and get it out there as much as I can have that framework available. And then look at things like, okay, now I'm going to do some story modules or some adventure paths and stuff in it. And maybe that's what gets monetized Mm -hmm. or I write a book and that's what gets monetized. But the, the setting that, you know, I can give you that taste, give you that initial hit. Maybe that just ends up being free. I don't know yet. Mm. So let's, let's take a theoretical person who's going to take the, you know, the core, whatever it is, and then do something of their own with it. How much time do you think they need to invest before it's useful to them? That'll depend on what they want to do with it. Now, let's let's say you're picking this up because it is your intention to run a Dungeons & Dragons homebrew campaign in this setting where you're less interested in having you know the Curse of Strahd module in front of you, but you like the idea of Barovia. Mm-hmm. You know? For that person, the content would be pretty useful immediately as long as I get enough of it together and can organize it in a way that is useful. Right. That's why I kind of used the, the the middle earth, not Lord of the Rings kind of thing. Cause like with this framework, you should be able to basically start right away. Mm -hmm. Now, if it is your intention to, you know, specifically run a five E dungeons and dragons game in this setting, then maybe I need to have that companion piece in place so that you can make, 5e work with the different constraints and realities that are in place in this particular setting to give you an idea of of what i mean by that you right now once you you had all of this material in front of you could probably start running a 5e game in it without a companion piece Mm -hmm. there's elves there's dwarves there's orcs there's okay well there's there's rules for playing those classes i'm putting my own little spin on them i'm trying to turn some knobs to make that more interesting Providing you with that information will ease you into to, to this world. Mm-hmm. Some things like um, character creation rules, things like the lifespans of all these races and 
you know, how they can relate and how they can breed with each other and blah, like I'm, I'm redoing a lot of that. A lot of those rules are going to change specifically for this game setting. Mm -hmm. Elves aren't going to live to be 700 years while humans are dying at 80. We're going to kind of pull everybody in, get rid of a lot of that baggage, get rid of a lot of the stereotypes and like one dimensional sort of archetypes for things like orcs and humans and elves. And we're going to add a, like a thin layer of sophistication. They all live about you know the same lifespan. They can all breed with each other. In fact, most of the population of this world is going to be of mixed heritage somehow. That will be an important factor in, I want to create D and D five E characters that fit in this setting. So I probably need to explain that. Here's how the rules get adjusted for playing your SRD classes, SRD races in this setting. Hmm. It's, you know what, it's just as a side note, it's kind of interesting that you, I ask you a question and you kind of get to, you know, running down towards the end of it. And then you lead perfectly into what I wrote down as the next question. It's almost like we rehearsed this. We didn't. No, we didn't. My next question is, you talk about seeds and fence posts. Can you describe a few? And is this where you sort of start? Sure. All right. <laughs> Let me talk a little inspiration first, because then my seed will make a little bit more sense. This probably doubles as fence posts. I'm creating a world, but I'm creating a small world. I've talked about it on the show before. I'm fascinated by the history of what you might call the known world if you'd lived around like the Mediterranean Sea area in the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. Think Mesopotamia, Anatolia, Egypt, northern edge of Africa, that kind of thing. That's a sort of scale that I'm aiming for. So think city states more than nations, kind of all wrapped up in an almost closed system where no part of the world is so far away that it's completely isolated and disconnected from everything else. Um, my campaign setting is sort of continental archipelago where it's a few sort of land masses, an inner sea that's connected to this outer ocean or whatever you want to call it. It's just called the expanse. Like, you know, it is, it is a small world. Like it is possible for a person in this world, maybe not to see it all, but to see the tourist attractions of it all over their lifespan. Um, I don't have the, the dimensions off hand, but you know, if you're going to draw a square that is maybe 2,500 miles by 2,500 miles, mm -hmm. everything, including the inner sea and all of that's going to kind of fit in that area. So still pretty big for flavor though. I want to give it just a light sprinkling of, I'm going to call it um, like proto etherpunk. I think I mentioned etherpunk to you um, before. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what etherpunk is, look it up. It's interesting. You've seen it before. I guarantee you've seen it before. Kind of like steampunk, but think a little bit more magical and arcane. It tends to be pretty overt and dense in its presentation. D&D uh, &D actually has a campaign setting, Eberron, which we've talked about before, that is very etherpunk. Uh, there's a Magic the Gathering playing Kaladesh is another good example of it. Fictional portrayals of Atlantis tend to lean into what most people would call etherpunk. Uh, most of the Final Fantasy games sort of flirt with it as well. I love that aesthetic, but I don't want to go that overt. Mm -hmm. Instead of turning it up to 11, I want to turn it like down to about one and a half, like be really more subtle. Not everybody in this world is going to be a practitioner of magic, sort of like your typical D&D &D setting. But magic in this world can be seen almost like a natural resource, mm -hmm. uh, leveraged in much like we would have looked at electricity, right? When we were first turning it to practical uses. So maybe you're not a magic practitioner, but... Uh, what would your life be like if you had lightning in a bottle? Yeah, um, like a magic battery available to you. What sort of simple magic appliances might you cram those little batteries into? Um, you know, we're not talking about magic sky beams or spell jammers yet. You know, maybe that's my world's distant future. We're at the very sort of early stages of that development. Um, I'm kind of approaching it more from a, you know, magic as a science angle. I don't want to get too complex with it, but I like the 
the theme of this magic is out there and and if you study enough or you have innate abilities to do so you can harness it you know you're not just who putting on a show waving your fingers and spells happen think magic items and and clothing that would exist in a D campaign mm-hmm. you know instead of arch fey or some wizard lich casting vague spells on them there's more like this artisan crafts person approach to it yeah you, know, you could be wearing like a plain tunic but like how much cooler would it be to have a a tunic that's been crafted by the hands of like a skilled essence weaver Essence is my particular spin on a magic system here. Think the force mixed with the weave, but give it a legally distinct name. I'm not reinventing the wheel. Um, The essence is the thing that's out there that if you know what you're doing and you have the right skills, you can harness it, channel it, bend it to your will. As long as you have the right number of midichlorians. Yeah. Yeah. One good point of inspiration was the Patrick Rothfuss books that we read last year. Not so much the the way he talked about like the splitting the mind and 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 doing sympathetic magic that way. More how he was approaching things like the the sigil tree, the stuff he was doing in the 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 workshop at school, mm-hmm. crafting runes and mechanisms specifically meant to channel and perform magics into a task. Mm-hmm. It's not a spell so much as it is an arcane blueprint for doing something, a program, like you would write computer software, an instruction set for channeling this power into doing whatever it is you need to do. That's sort of the level that I'm trying to to go for just flavor. So think, you know, magic lamps and, and simple devices, not so much flying spaceships. Tangent. This all kind of stems, and this is how we can talk about the process a little bit more from me trying to figure out currency. You remember when we were talking about your campaign and I was like, how does trade work in this world? And the answer is I don't care yet. Right. (laughs) Well, I cared and I started exploring it and I started thinking about things like, well, these people have magic available to them. How might they solve problems like counterfeiting coins in this world? Coins are minted using a mix of alchemy and, and, you know, infusing them with essence or whatever. And then it literally went down another road where it's like, okay, that's cool. And I'm going to do that. But let's have this other currency that is literally these magic batteries that I was referring to. They serve both a practical function and as an item of value. Well, I mean, it almost seems ridiculous to have coins at all. Why wouldn't you just specifically trade in amounts of essence? If it has a tangible quantity, um, but there's a there's a problem that comes up, and it comes up in in Dungeons and Dragons and various settings like that a lot as well. Is like if you have these arch wizards, and if you can study and learn magic, why the hell would you be a farmer? Like mm-hmm. who in this world? What type of person in this world is is actually tilling the earth and growing food for people? Mm-hmm. Or is it all machines? Is it all automated? And and where I am with the level of development on this is I'm going to approach it like in a world where you could be a wealthy doctor or a dentist or a astrophysicist or, or something like that, or you could be a rock star, something that is more innate talent rather than sort of an academic talent in some cases. Why would you be a janitor? Well, in some circumstances, it's because there's social social barriers to you going mm-hmm in those places. Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's getting a little bit deep when you're talking about, here's the thing that we want to do for fun. Right? Yeah, no, but the, you know, to, to paint the picture of the world, like it's a valid question. And, and, and my answer would be not everybody has the attitude or aptitude or innate skill set to do that. That doesn't mean that they can't work as a farmer so that they can afford their magic batteries to light their home. I, I'm not a, a nuclear engineer, but my LED lights here sure sure like sipping off that electricity that you know we're generating. Yeah, fair enough. I, I, I do want to approach the magic stuff very much as a craft. It's a craft that is held in high regard, and those with the aptitudes and attitudes and skills can go a long way. But I also don't want it to get too weird, like where it's just like there's everyday people and then there's arch wizards and nothing in between. Like I really like the idea of there being people that are 
doing shit with this essence that are like a really good blacksmith. Man, the steel that I make is just top notch relative to what the the average person's doing, whether it's the materials and knowledge and know how that's been passed on generations. I am just better at this than everyone else. And if you want quality sword, quality armor, whatever it is, if you can afford me, I'm the guy you come to. That works for blacksmiths. That works for hiring musicians. I think it can work for this as well. Yeah, I think it. there's definite parallels to draw. I, I definitely think it gets a little bit wonky when you like turn up the, the, the knob to 11, right? Like you think about steampunk, I think more, more people know what that is. But if everybody's a tinker or an artificer, you know, they mm-hmm. can build machines out of out of harnessing the power of, of cool looking steam. All you got to do is slap some extra gears on it. Well, yeah. Why would anybody farm, right? Well, you you build steam machines to do your farming. Yeah. And and I think that where does this this setting go in the future? Like that that would be the next logical progression. Like, you know, we're we're at the stage now where we're between having like a hand plow or a plow that's pulled by oxes and having a combine. Mm-hmm. Right? What's the in between step there? Whether it's it's the equivalent of like electrical hand tools or or something like that that doesn't drastically change things mm-hmm. from a like you know state of the world. In fact, sometimes the magic is just replacing what might have been technological innovation in some cases. You know, does a magic lamp work all that better from one that burns oil? I don't know. Probably stinks less. Right. Maybe it you know burns forever or it has some unique abilities or whatever. But it's flavor. More, it's flavor more than than substance, I guess. I don't know. So I have one last question. Okay. You, you mentioned roadblocks and rabbit holes. Yes. And what what exactly do you mean by that? Well, give three examples. <laughs> Five hundred words, double space, due tomorrow. I've joked about it before. Uh, when we were talking about other things, but I've realized in this process that my one true nemesis in this world is choosing a name for something. <laughs> you know, I run into this problem when I'm playing video games, creating D and D characters, NPCs. Like I can pull a great idea right out of my ass, making a character playing WoW or whatever. You know, run through character creation, a few minutes, get it looking exactly like I want, and then I spend 17 hours staring at that empty name field. <laughs> every single time and it's not just naming people in this case it's naming like cities and, and organizations and stuff again i'm not naming every little river or anything like that but i'm trying to figure out the power centers the the, the high level things that influence the world at a, sort of a fundamental level you know if this is the fertile crescent like i'm, I'm trying to figure out the city of ur or uh nineveh or what became babylon that's what i'm i'm, I'm trying to do and here's what's funny about this. Most authors, this is the one thing about fantasy that always pisses me off. And this is the one thing that like, I could never get my wife into fantasy because every time I've tried, she's run into this names. Like you run into, you know, books and and you get all of these names of places and characters where they just like mashed a bunch of letters together until they found something that looked fantasy enough. Yep. Put a couple of apostrophes in there and call it good. Yeah, regardless of whether or not you'd sprain your tongue trying to pronounce any of it. You know, and there's the extreme opposite of that where, you know, nothing pulls me out faster than getting into a fantasy story and find out that this, like, important character, eldritch horror or whatever, his name is Bob. <laughs> there was, a, sorry, a tangent. There was a character, a, a, a mini boss, I guess he was, in EverQuest in the bottom of a tower on on Lachlan, which was the, the third expansion. Mm-hmm. And his name was Lord Dojij. Jim, I don't know. There was like 14 J's and threes and R's and stuff. And he was like, sort of um, like they were, they were riffing on the idea that of the gin, right. Cause he's mm-hmm. very much a sort of that sort of character model looking thing. Um, no one, I don't think anyone has ever actually pronounced it to my satisfaction. And he is literally called in all of the official documentation and strategy guides, Lord Bob. <laughs> and when you see him and you see his name and you're like, yep, that's Bob. 
Yeah. Because it's it literally like you've got the name tag above the, the character on the screen and it fills your screen. Mm-hmm. Right. It's 20 some odd characters long. It's ridiculous. But yeah, I agree with you. Naming is it's tough because you have to give something that has uh, some sort of flavor that gives you a feeling of like, I, I think I've heard of that before. Right. Like the city of Ur, for example, I know absolutely nothing about it, but the name like brings up ideas of things because I've heard it in various places before. Yeah. So you don't want something that sounds like nothing. You don't want something that sounds too plain. Yeah. You got to find that right balance that like sounds believable, but affords you the flexibility to do the things you need to do. Right. Like, you can't just come up with a random city name. This is, you know, it's not just the name. It's like, okay, so I name a city this. What word will they use to talk about people that come from this city? Right? And you can't just have a name that says... Right? You can't just have a name that sounds like somebody choking on a piece of sushi or something and that onions onto the end of it. (laughs) Oh, Rick Talk onions. I, you know, here's here's an interesting unless that's idea. what you're going for. Like, there's yeah, times could, where you can go for that. Sure, sure. Um, I, I wonder if you could get away with it creating a world where all of the major cities were named after social media platforms. Like over here, you've got Redditon, and over there, you've got TikTokville, and you have here, to you've send got you a Farmville. picture. It's old now, but uh, in my office, I don't know if you've seen it hanging up by the front door. We have a map on the wall that looks like like the map you'd see in like a geography classroom, except that it is all land masses sized based on like internet platforms and stuff. So there's, you know, Facebook Facebook and and Amazon and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that, that image before. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's an interesting, interesting way of looking at the world. (laughs) So that's the biggest hurdle. I have to thank my wife because like I, I was at the point where it's like, I, I just, I can't, I can't, I've been, I've been nitpicking over these things too much and uh, had a conversation with her. I'm like, I need this. I want it to do this. I need it to sound kind of like this. Can you just throw some names at me? I didn't use all the names that she gave me. I did manage to work a couple of them in, but she got me, got me going, Mm -hmm. you know, that when, when we were talking about world building, that's exactly what I wanted from you. Mm -hmm. It's hard to deliver, especially if you're a detail oriented person, it's really hard to give somebody that. Uh, the other big hurdle, uh, to go back to that question that uh, I'm having, is allowing myself, uh, and you do this too, I'm sure, allowing yourself to be satisfied with something that really should just be a rough draft oh, or a prototype. That's so hard. The map, I, I showed you a link. It was sort of an older version of the map, but it's a good example of this. I know that if I'm ever going to turn this into a product to share with people, I'm just going to hire somebody with the cartography chops to do a proper map for me. Like you can go onto places like Fiverr and platforms like that and find all kinds of people that do that. So I could be sketching this on the back of a napkin at this point, and I probably should be, but I'm not. I'm monkeying around with fucking fractal shape generators coming up with boundaries that I liked, and I'm spending time laying it all out in Photoshop, coloring it fucking applying textures to it so that it looks like a, you know, old parchment and shit. Like what the fuck do I need to do that for now? You don't No, I run into, I run into this both in creative things and at work. And there's a, there's a saying at work, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Cause there's times like the, there's not a single drawing that I have ever done. Cause I do like actual CAD drafting for that's my job. Um, and there has never been a time that I have done a drawing that you couldn't bring it back to me now with some red ink on it and say, this could be better. Because mm-hmm. that, that will always be true, right? Like, no matter how good the drawing is, it could be better. And at some point, you just have to say, this is good enough for the purpose I need it for. And it's hard. for what I'm doing right now, it's all the more ridiculous because, like, I'm doing this for an audience of one. I'm not presenting that drawing to really any. I mean, I'm going to share it with you and you know, mm-hmm. whatnot. But right now it's, it's basically functioning as a whiteboard and I'm scribbling with dry erase markers and placing a city on the map somewhere. And then I'm rubbing it out and I'm moving it over somewhere else because it feels a little bit better. I'm, I'm figuring out where biomes basically are so that I can use that to, you know, world mm-hmm. build. I don't need fucking a map laid out in oceans like water, right on the map. Yep. 
and I'm showing with two different colors of blue, shallow and deep. Yeah. Why am I worried about that right now? But, you know, you just, you get into it, you start, you get on a roll. This whole thing started because I got on a roll. You start putting time in it. You're like, mm, mm, mm. I could have been, you know, done in five minutes if I'd had just been scribbling it on a paper and then moved on. Right. Yeah. It's the moving on part that's hard. That's the thing that's actually always stopped me when I've, I've started writing something is that I get to a certain point and it's like, I want to go back to the beginning and like fix the spelling or I don't like the phrasing of this particular description. And it's like, stop it. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Yeah. Yeah. I get hung up. I mean, what, what other kind of shit do you get hung up on? I know that you're, you're working on stuff. I mean, you had this whole map scale thing that you talked about a little bit, like four hours ago now. Yeah. It's I, I almost all the same stuff. Like I don't, I don't typically get hung up on names the same way that you do. Um, usually it's naming character names. I have like a stock set of names that I'm just like, this is good enough. And it's like, you know, the word yeah. snow and then some description of what the character is good enough. Fine. But if you were writing a book, you wouldn't do that. No, but I started writing a book and I, I just, I give people code names, right? Like, it's like, this is the name I'm going to, I'm going to call this character Fox because they're like Fox Mulder from X-Files. And I'm just going to call them Fox through the whole book. And then when I get to the end and I'm finished and I've got like, you know, 600 pages of, of, of a book that I'm going to send to a publisher, I'll do a find replace on Fox. And just by that point, I'll have hopefully figured out a name. No. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I I end up with major problems when I'm making because I'm making a map for our Sunday game and like I have a continent size thing and I'm trying to put down like what are the street names on the city right mm -hmm. I, don't, I, I don't need it I just I don't it should be a no. separate map but yeah yeah I get I get way way more detailed than I need to be so, I don't know like names for me they're just one of those things where like they're a reflection of the cultures that create them right so if I'm trying to communicate culture if I'm trying to create subtext and not actual text like the names are important now in fantasy there's the tropey stuff right like an elven name should sound roughly elven there's this depending on how you're setting your orcs up culturally their saint names and cities and places are going to sound a little bit different your dwarf ones, you know, they're going to have... They sound like rocks, that's all. Yeah, you know, so for the elves, because there's this, you know, elves have their own sort of elfin thing. Like, I have I do have a lot of apostrophes, but I'm trying to avoid the, the something that sounds like you're rattling gravel around in Tupperware, you know? <laughs> I didn't talk about really the seed idea much, and I'm not going to get into it now or an hour and a half in, but... The TLDR of it is that these people that live in this world were brought to this world. One moment they were living in a typical fantasy big city. It really doesn't matter. They were living in a legally distinct place called um, Water Shallow. Whatever. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Next minute they were somewhere else. Stars in the sky are different. There's two moons where there should only be one. Different flora, different fauna. The days themselves are longer. 25,000 people just sort of picked up out of this city because it's an interesting thought experiment. I'm choosing that it was like a commons district of the city. So you're not scooping up royalty or kings or, you know, people that would have high standing in whatever society would have existed there. You're just, you're picking up regular blue collar people. You're dropping them in the middle of somewhere else completely. And then the thought experiment is, Try and figure out what would happen for 500 years because my setting picks up at year 500. Mm. So the fun creative process is in the time it takes, say, 500 years for this, this 25,000 people and whatever miscellaneous parts of their city ended up landed with them, their cats, their dogs, the you know remnants of the market from the street over. Like That's the starting point. What do those people do? You know, there's there's interesting ideas of some people might try and turn to what would be their old ways, right? Turn to spiritual stuff. I mentioned before, but I've I've got an idea that some of the Elven peoples in this predicament legitimately believe or are paying homage to the fact uh, that some believe that this was their ancestral homeland that was thought to be mythology. Some of the orcs, 
they're looking at this as like their first level of the afterlife, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that affects how they name things. Some of that population will, will lean heavily into the more spiritual. That's kind of the angle that I'm looking at taking with the orcs. Um, I mentioned Vulcans earlier, but like, I, I, I don't like thinking of orcs the way a lot of people do in fantasy. Sort of the bad guys, they're evil, they're one dimensional, barely more than animals kind of things. I'm almost taking them into like the, the, the space orcs or the Klingon kind of thing, dialing mm -hmm. back the cartoonishness, then bringing them back into a situation where some of them could choose to lean into the, the warrior ethos. Some of them might choose to lean heavily into the spiritual stuff. And a significant population is just going to be like everybody else and be like, you know, we kind of got to band together, man. Like this, this place is kind of fucked. There's, there's an interesting thought that I would like to plant in your brain. Okay. There was, and I, I don't know where I picked up this story. I'm fairly certain that it's mostly fictional. It might've been James Mishner um, in one of his books, but they were doing an archeological dig somewhere just outside of Jerusalem. Right. And they're, they're digging through layers of sort of the last few thousand years of civilization, you know, and here's, here's like someone had a campfire here, you know, and, and here's some pots that we found. And then they get down past all of these things that are hundreds and maybe thousands of years old and they find a Coke can. Right. And it sort of the, the, what you, what you're intended to take away from that is like, here's all of these things that are like distinct and different and based on the flavor of, of whatever. And then you find out like, Oh shit, right in the middle of all of these things that are super unique is this one thing that sort of unites the world. Right. Which I'm not suggesting that we should all worship a Coke can or anything, but like the idea is that like you can buy diet Coke anywhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right. And here it is in the middle of this archeological dig where they're finding all of these really old, things right and how do you how do you account for that you know and sort of on the one side of the the argument as well it's just an anachronism you know like some i don't know or whatever and the, then there's the other side of it like this was actually a garbage dump and all of these things that we thought were really old were just things that someone had thrown away and we've been digging through a hobo encampment mm -hmm. right but sort of what i take away from it is that like no matter how how much the influence of a certain thing on society is, there are other things that are sort of like all together and always there. So you've got like elves and dwarves and orcs and, and whatever, and they're all over the place. And, you know, like the elves have their kind of name, the orcs have their kind of name, and, you know, the dwarves have their kind of names. Mm -hmm. But especially in this situation, like I would expect to see dwarves with orcish names. Mm-hmm. Right. And orcs with elvish names. There certainly yeah. would be. But there's, you know, the, the, when you start with that 25,000, people are going to freak out. They're going to go in all sorts of different directions. There's going to be some that sort of lean into the, oh shit, like, you know, we got to go right. back to the old ways. So you might even get the, the, you know, the, the more malicious side of that. The, hey, we're a bunch of mixed bloods and we need to, to go the eugenics angle and purify ourselves as a, as a race or whatever. And, you know, selective breeding until we can get back to that orcish ideal or or whatever it is but the reality is most of the people in this world are going to be very very mixed and maybe that's where you know bob and and sue and mary like the, that comes in you'll definitely get the 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 dwarves with with orc names and stuff like that as well just that idea of like how would people react to this situation? Not immediately. Like, okay, there's an interesting story to tell there. Like, how did it happen? Why did it happen? What or who is responsible? I don't plan on answering that mystery. Good. You know, the answer is not important. The impact the mystery has on how these people develop afterwards is what's important. Some of them may turn spiritual. Were they rescued? Was this a, like an arc situation? where they were spared from an apocalypse they weren't even aware of. I kind of played around with that idea, but I decided that doesn't matter. Don't, don't answer the mystery. They're here. They all have different beliefs for where here is. And they, you know, not everybody's agreeing and different ideas of what that means and how they should react to it. And when you zoom out and, and, and watch that happen over 500 years, like it's almost a bit like playing, you know, civilization or, or something like that. Right. Populous. 
Yes, where you just you try and think of what would what would happen is these people like, you know, realistically speaking, by the time you get to when the game or story is going to be taking place, it's not 25,000 people anymore. It's, it's 10 million people living in this world. 500 years later, that might be a little too many. Not too bad, actually, when you run the numbers based on average population growth. I mean, it's exponential, right? Like it, it well, does it, go up it, pretty quickly. It depends, like, because there's some some environmental factors there too. If you oh, look for at sure, you, for sure, you look at human population over the course of forever. Because the BBC actually just did something on this like two or three years ago, and it's literally it looks like a flat line until about 1910, mm -hmm. and then it goes bloop, up to eight billion. So yeah, but you look at um, these people are coming from another place, so there's a certain amount of innate knowledge, and it's not you know they're not having to invent the plow again. They know what a plow is. They mm -hmm. just got to make one out of what materials they have here. So there's a bit of a fast track there. Um, but yeah, no, I get it. And then, you know, I just threw out 10 million as a number. Like there's a lot of things that we're just going to kind of hand wave away. I'm not going to get involved in like the discussion about whether this, this fantasy races uh, minimum viable population for, for repopulating uh, without like completely diluting their gene pool. Yeah. <laughs> not going to get into all of that, right? You have limits. That's good. Limits are good. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm I'm, I'm approaching it from a, a very high-level systems, not low-level systems approach. I don't need to explain everything. There's just things I would like to have plausible explanations for so that they feel right. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Anyway. <sighs> It's it's this whole big thing. At some point, I'm going to be running games in this setting. Um, I'm going to be doing um, paid mini campaigns. Uh, Start playing is the name of the platform I'm doing. I'm going to be running some. I mentioned West Marches when we were talking the other day, like a West yeah. Marches adjacent kind of series of games. It's going to function more like a series of one shots, kind of like episodic TV almost. People can drop in, drop out. I'm going to try and do that at different points within this setting, just so that I have an excuse to add some flavor and develop this part of the world a little bit more. Let's add some flavor and develop this part of the world. You know, mm -hmm. it is at, at its roots, a fantasy setting. So there's fantastical nature of, of, of stuff in here. Like you're going to look at my map and I'm going to have biomes, right? Like you're going to be like, ah, I don't know. I mean, you've got this place that's a forest right there, and you're trying to convince me that on the other side of that mountains is a desert? That, that sounds plausible, as long as the winds are blowing the right way. Right. Like, yeah, there's a reason for it. Shut up. Magic. <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I, I, I remember drawing up a map one time. We were working at Stream, and I was, I was just doodling, right? And I'm like on the phone with some poor old lady who's trying to format her computer or something won't let me go. So there's lots and lots of silence. I got an eight and a half by 11 sheet and I'm just drawing a shape and I'm drawing some mountains up the middle of it. And I'm drawing some rivers and I'm drawing, and I did the rivers wrong. I know that, right. Having looked at the world and how it works, rivers join up. They don't branch out. Who knew? Unless you have a Delta, which is the sort of special mm -hmm. situation. Um, you know, but I drew this thing and I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this. This is like artistically has it, it has merit, right? Mm -hmm. Not like I'm going to frame it and hang it yeah. in the national gallery. I expected this to could be complete ass. And actually it's only a little bit shit. Yeah. Like it looks okay. Like I feel okay. Like showing this to people and saying, look what I did. Right. Cause I'm not an artist, right? I'm, I'm answering phone calls for a living. I, obviously I have no talent and I showed it to somebody and he said, there's no reason for those mountains to be there. And I'm like, who the fuck are you? You answer phones for a living too. You're not a geologist. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, Some people are yeah. just going to be like that, man. Oh, there's so many people. I watch, I've been watching a lot of uh, a BBC show called Have I Got News For You. I highly recommend it. It's lots, lots of fun. Uh, the, the people on it are are very, very clever. But they had a, a guest on who was a, a young uh, conservative member of parliament. And it was about the time that uh, the Occupy Wall Street stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. So they had like this tent encampment in front of St. Paul's Cathedral, right? 
And her response to that was, well, they're obviously not serious because, you know, I was down there and the lineup for Starbucks was big and the tents were very expensive. You know, and of course, everybody just jumped on that. Like, what? So if they buy a cup of coffee, they're not allowed to be angry about the bankers ruining the economy. You know, if they have a nice tent, they're not allowed to be dissatisfied with the economic situation in the world. It's like you can't just pick one thing and say everything's invalid because of the anyway. I don't know. People, man, life would be so much better if there were no people. That's why you got to got to create your own fantasy world so you can populate it with people that you don't utterly hate. Well, I mean, I created my own fantasy world and I confused everybody by making money not really a thing. And it is confusing the heck out of people. But you didn't. You did. You don't have money. We've got stones. Oh, so they're round coins that aren't made of metal. They represent uh, something. Something. There's a there's a so, there's a value associated with them. A, yes, a, a but, favor. A, 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 yes, but a solid. I owe you one. That's pretty much what that is. It is a physical representation of I owe you one. It's called money, man. It's literally money. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's okay. So yes, functionally, it's the same thing. But but there is an important distinction. A dollar is worth a dollar everywhere you go. Stones are not worth the same thing to everyone everywhere you go. Well, the other town doesn't use stones, man. They use sticks. They might. They might. You never know. You've only you've literally been to one town so far. Yeah, it's funny. I, one of the things, and I won't get into the details about it here, but one of the things I did spend a lot of time on was that coinage shit because I wanted to avoid the standard silver, gold, silver gold electrum kind of thing. Like yep. at, at some point I had to, you know, they're going to use a coin. It's probably going to be based on a metal. It's not going to be gold because that'd be rare. So I ended up with like copper and, and and I did do some silver and created sort of this unique thing for it. But like, that's another tangent. I went down for like four days, man. <laughs> it's a big problem. Listen, the biggest minds in our world can't fix it. How the hell are we going to figure it out for something that we're going to do for four hours on a Sunday twice or three times a month? I have been able to show some restraint, whether it's this or other things. Like sometimes you're just adding complexity for the sake of complexity, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that I got into was like figuring out like calendar and days and stuff. You're in a different world. How does that work? Overcomplicating it would be like. Did you not build an ancillary sphere so that you could check out the phases of the moon based on where things are in the. Uh... I'm working on my, my, my essence powered one, actually. <laughs> no, I've I've got I've got some doodles for it, but there's you know there's certain things that you have to like not do, right? Like it's okay, I think to you know, in my case, I've got a week that's six days, a month that's twenty four, but it's just two moons, so it's twenty four days orbit of the large moon, seasonal cycles, yada yada. But when you get down to the stuff that really matters to people, like if I'm going to play a game or read a book or whatever, I don't need to like change days, hours, minutes. Those those just say days, hours, and minutes. You don't want to confuse people. Are you not going to do decimal time? Oh, let me tell you. Magic clocks. <laughs> but you, you got to buy the upgrade. Essence volume. It's going to change the world. And, and if you've got three days, I'll sit down and tell you about it sometime. You could just send me a copy of your newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm excited to, to explore this more. If anybody's listening and you have interest in jumping into a D&D game that I might run at some point, um, use promo code NUTTY. No, uh, <laughs> just just <laughs> say howdy. Uh, I, I said I was going to do some paid games in this, but uh, any fans of the pod, I'm not going to make you pay to sit in on a game. Just hit me up. Oh, there's there's actual advantages to being a fan now. That's right. Step one, perks. Step two, Profit. <laughs> I think you step you, you I think you've mixed five thousand seven hundred and ninety-six steps between the step one and profit. I was uh I saw a post uh, the other day of a guy who was posting for uh a hundred thousand subscribers to his YouTube channel. And he's made six hundred and thirty-five videos or something, and he's been doing it for almost ten years. It's like finally got there. <laughs> I'm like, uh some places, some things just take off and some things don't. I think we're in the not really going to take off sphere. Speaking of YouTube, I got a parting gift for you. I think you'll like okay. this one if you don't know about it. 
and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Anybody want a peanut? Full disclaimer, I've watched like five videos on this channel so far. I tripped over it by accident the other day. I'm loving what I've seen so far. Maybe the rest of it is trash. I don't know. If it is, not my fault. I warned you. Uh, the YouTube channel is called Breaking Taps. For the most part, it's this nerdy guy doing semi-educational sort of experimental videos focusing mostly on like materials science and machining. Um, the one video that I tripped over that uh, uh, I watched first was one that was talking about um, the differences between the heat shields that uh, were used on the space shuttle, what SpaceX is using um, in their Starship prototypes, and then actually manufacturing based on the publicly available information about the, the shuttle program, mm -hmm. manufacturing those materials himself and putting them through tests. He's got um, like a whole lab full of equipment. So almost every video he's done, like you're looking through a scanning electron microscope at something. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like it's, it's fascinating. It would be. Um, there was another video that looked at um, just the process of like machining metal close up, you know, like uh, cutting tools under a scanning electron microscope, just sort of advancing them, watching how the metal shears in a couple of different spots, depending on the, the shape and angle of the cutting tool. And it was really interesting because I did, a, this is one of the things that I went through in school. I was really interested to find out that cutting isn't really a thing. No. Like you don't, you don't cut, you actually put pressure on, it's pressure that cuts mm -hmm. and it, it shears like below the, it's weird. So that is really interesting. Yeah. And, and, you know, like you look at these videos and he was trying to, you know, he can't do full motion videos. So it's just like he'd, he'd build a little jig so that he could move this cutting tool across the metal and just he'd turn a knob and it'd be like a few thou here, a few thou here, and you'd watch it. And of course, at that scale, it just looks like you're scooping ice cream, right? And watching it yep. curl over and break in different ways and sort of compact and press itself until it like there's a shear point at the end of the cutting tip. But that pressure mm -hmm. forms the the main shear line underneath it, like you're saying, and it's just uh, it's interesting. Yeah, you know, it's 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 visual ASMR, I guess. Like it is educational. You got to be a real nerd to probably find the value in it. I would not call it entertaining in a traditional sense, but uh, what I've seen so far, I've really been enjoying. Uh, breaking taps. Find them on YouTube. I'll check it out. So so we did another one of these. How did it go? Did we do okay? We did all right, I think. Um, so what is it? It's 2024 now. It is. Uh, 2026 for the next one? Or do you want to? Um, I think we could probably set something up for around midsummer. Like maybe we, we could do like a 1st of July, 4th of July special. Yeah. We could we could go the Top Gear route. And instead of doing like a weekly episode, we could do like two specials a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll get back into it and it'll be it'll be fun. I, I missed our weekly get together gab session. I did so. too. I'm glad we're uh we're getting back into it. Um no fist fights. Some arm wrestles. But you know, I we worked it out. To be fair, we greased ourselves up before the arm wrestling. <laughs> I was just about to make a mud wrestling gag. Uh, although, I mean, I did, I did talk about bear sex at halfway through. So <sighs> spoilers.